to make real the promises of democracy. Today, we commemorate the 92nd anniversary of Dr. King's birth by honoring his lifelong commitment and achievements toward his dream for social change. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood for equal freedom for all. He protested racial discrimination in federal and state law and became the chief spokesperson for nonviolent activism in the civil rights movement. Even the Prime Osborne Convention Center that we're coming to you live from was a public building that enforced segregation for many years. If you wanted to get in or out of Jacksonville, the railroad was the way to go. And there was one grand way in and one grand way out, the Jacksonville Terminal train station. Having opened on November 17, 1919, the Jacksonville Union Terminal was the rail gateway to Florida and during six decades of service was the largest railroad station in the South and among the busiest terminals in the country with up to 10 million passengers in a single year. The terminal was located in La Villa, an historic African-American suburban neighborhood. It was a heavy area of traffic for the Jacksonville Railroad industry and was referred to as the Harlem of the South, the mecca for African-American culture and heritage in Florida. Like many other public buildings in the nation at that time, the Jacksonville Terminal featured a separate waiting area for black residents an unfortunate reality of the time. Passengers would wait for their trains in the segregated waiting room, very different from the grand arched ceiling in the main waiting room. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. became a leader in the civil rights movement when he was involved in the Montgomery bus boycott, which was a catalyst for change, ending racial segregation on all Montgomery public buses. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. About one year after Dr. King's speech at the March on Washington, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed into law, ending segregation in public places and banning employment discrimination. Dr. King's unwavering efforts transformed him into a national figure and the best known spokesman of the civil rights movement. When all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Good morning, I'm Joy Purdy with News for Jax. Welcome to the 34th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast presented by Florida Blue. This year's event is a little different, but we are grateful to have you all virtually with us. Let us highlight the event for everyone watching. Today, we'll begin with the national anthem performed by Olivia Donaldson and words of encouragement by Pastor Mark Griffin. And good morning, I'm Tanika Hughes with Action News Jax. Today's program will continue with a performance of Lift Every Voice and Sing, as well as a presentation of this year's winners of Tomorrow's Leaders, presented by Star Credit Union. Later, we're going to hear from our presenting sponsor, Florida Blue, as well as our Be the Change Scholarship Program sponsor, TIAA Bank. Good morning, I'm Anthony Austin with First Coast News and we have a packed program for you all today. A few of our community leaders are here with us to participate in a keynote panel discussion and we thank them so much for being here this morning. Today's keynote panelists include Jacksonville Mayor Lenny Curry, Superintendent of Duval County Public Schools and 2021 Florida Superintendent of the Year, Dr. Diana Green, CEO of UF Health Jacksonville, Dr. Leon Haley, and President and CEO of United Way Northeast Florida, Michelle broad to begin the program we will honor our great country with a national anthem performed by olivia donaldson she's a jacksonville native who attended douglas anderson school of the arts then graduated from ithaca college she was featured in disney's aladdin on tour before being in disney's aladdin on broadway oh say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed At the twilight's last gleaming 
whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Thank you, Olivia. And now, please join us in welcoming Pastor Mark Griffin from Wayman Ministries for today's words of encouragement. Love is the foundation of my faith in God. The Bible says that God is love. In fact, to be more accurate, 1 John 4 and 8 says that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love then becomes the true litmus test for those of us who call ourselves Christians or neighbors or friends, even those who call themselves patriots. During his speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. King made the comment of sticking with love instead of hate. It was in 1967, a time when hate was acceptable, when hate was to some extent the status quo. And if we're not careful, we could find ourselves not going back to the future, but instead going forward to our past a past when we judge people by the color of their skin and not by the content of their character. This profound speech was delivered to an audience that was full of preachers. King was telling church leaders how important it was to stick with love, even when tempted to resort to hate. He said one of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have usually been contrasted as opposites so that love is often identified with a resignation of power and power with a denial of love. As a pastor, I think it is critical that we understand, as King did, that love does not denote weakness, but in fact, it demonstrates one power, one strength. I'm strong enough to love you even when your actions towards me are hateful. I'm strong enough to forgive you even when you have wronged me. But I'm also strong enough to stand up to the injustices that occur in our society, not just in 1967, but even in 2021. My taking a stance against hate is not an abandonment of love, but an embracement of love. On the other hand, hate does not denote strength. It denotes the weakness of a man or a woman. It weakens our world, our nation, our society, our relationships. Further, it weakens not the one being hated, but the one who harbors the hate. In 1967, King said, I've seen too much hate on the faces of sheriffs in the South, Klansmen and other leaders, and I know that it does something to them. That's how he concluded that hate was too great a burden to bear. If we're going to love, we must understand that love does not say love does. You see, love is an action word. We cannot just talk about love. We must put love in action. Jesus said, Peter, if you love me, you will feed my sheep. In other words, you will do something. If we're going to stick with love, we must address the racial divide that continues to exist. If we're going to stick with love, we must address poverty in pockets of our society. If we're going to stick with love, we must ensure equal justice under the law. We must commit to fair access to housing and credit and adequate wages. If we're serious about sticking to love, we must ensure that all of our children receive a quality education. We must also ensure that the people 
most impacted by COVID-19 are not the last ones to receive the protection afforded by the vaccines. Love doesn't mean that I remain silent, but just the opposite, that I speak up, that I stand up, that I wake up, that I live up to our Lord's words. In as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. For how can you say you love me whom you've never seen and you do not love in action those whom you see every day? Right now, our nation is bearing the burden of hate. Watching what transpired in our nation's capital can only be described as hate, not passion, nor zeal, but hate. We must not let hate become the order of the day. Hate is a, a mirage. It gives off the illusion of strength, but it is all so weak, so limited, so void of lasting effect. But love, on the other hand, is strong, it's powerful, it's mighty, for love never fails. We too, like King, must make the declaration to stick with what has brought us thus far. As we celebrate and remember the legacy of Dr. King, we must be reminded that Black Americans love this nation even when the nation did not love us in return. We believed in America and we still do. We plowed the fields. We worked the factories. We even sacrificed on the battlefields. Why? Because we've always loved America. Any parent who has more than one child know that even though you love all of your children equally, you still love them differently. We must understand that although we love America differently, we all love America equally. Our common love is what has sustained us even through the moments of hate. There's a hymn that we often sing in the church, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. If we're going to be lifted from this pandemic, from the social unrest, from the political divide, we will only be lifted by love. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for the other. I agree with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm sticking with love because hate is too great a burden to bear. Thank you, Pastor Griffin. It is our responsibility as leaders and mentors to lift and embody Dr. King's legacy by serving others in our community in order to bring about social change. When people come together and work with each other to make a community a better place is when true change and growth occurs. There are a number of people here today that work hard every day to lift Dr. King's legacy. Thank you for all you do for our community. In an effort to continue to represent the legacy, leadership, and service of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mayor Curry created a host committee for this annual celebration. This breakfast continues to lift Dr. King's legacy under their guidance. Thank you to the host committee members. This event wouldn't be possible without the support from the many partners and sponsors of this year's Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast. First, we would like to recognize our presenting sponsor, Florida Blue. Next, our Tomorrow's Leader Sponsor, ViStar Credit Union. Our Be The Change Scholarship Program Sponsor, TIAA Bank. Our Legacy Sponsors, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News, Jax. First Coast News, News 4, Jax, WJCT, ASM Global, Jacksonville, and Sight and Sound Productions. Lift Every Voice and Sing is often referred to as the Black National Anthem. It's a song originally written by James Weldon Johnson as a poem. The NAACP dubbed it as the Negro National Anthem as it was a cry for liberation and affirmation for African-American people. I'd like to introduce the Martin Luther King Jr. School of the Arts to perform this iconic song. Lift Every Voice and Sing often called the Black National Anthem, was written as a poem by NAACP leader James Weldon Johnson and then set to music by his brother John Russell Johnson in 1899. It was first performed in public in the Johnson's hometown of Jacksonville, Florida as part of a celebration of President Lincoln birthday on February 12, 1900 by a choir of 500 school children at the segregated Santa School where James Weldon Johnson was 
principle, left every voice and sang, and joy. Lift every voice and sing, to earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. So need the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the day that hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place on which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that the trees have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out from the gloomy past, till now we stand at last, where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. God of our wares, God of our Introducing tomorrow's leaders' winners, please welcome Amanda Crawford with ViStar Credit Union. The Tomorrow's Leaders Award recipients are nominated by a teacher or community organization for their volunteerism, leadership, and community service. These students are a diverse group of youth who epitomize the ideals and principles of Dr. King and work to lift his legacy in their everyday lives. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. This year, students submitted essays sharing about times in their lives when they chose love over hate, even when it seemed they might not be able to. Today, three students are being recognized as tomorrow's leaders. We will hear the essays from the first place elementary, middle and high school winners. Caden Cohen, fifth grade, Central Riverside Elementary. Charlotte Kessler, 8th grade, La Villa School of the Arts. Jagger Leach, 12th grade, Stanton College Preparatory. Now let's learn a little more about the winners as we watch a video about each and hear their winning essays. My name is Caden Cohen. I am 10 years old. I am in 5th grade and I go to Central Riverside Elementary School. Some people still can't get the gist that Martin Luther King died because he was fighting for our rights. He fought for the rights of the people with my color. We have a Caden Cohen here. <laughs> Come on, man. You are first place winner for tomorrow's leaders. When the mayor came to surprise you, how did what, what was going through your mind? I know shocked, but... <laughs> um, well... I really had no words. 
<laughs> yeah, we did. Just the way he, he put that together and he tied in so much of Dr. King with what he sees going on in the world um, in his life and then what he faces based on his race and his culture and how he brought all of that together and didn't spend an essay about me, me, me or complaining about what's going on in the world but put that whole spin on it about what needs to change, what's still changing, what has changed. Um, and it was just incredible. I wrote it with more intentions of doing good in the world. When people read my essay, I'm hoping that they see, well, dang, the world really isn't as good as it, it is supposed to be. What is hate? Hate is a strong dislike towards someone or something. We as people stumble upon hate too many times to count. Hate also tends to take on a life of its own, many times starting as a small seedling and spreading like a cancer across society, across humanity. As hate grows and spreads, we feel our nation's freedom, freedom slowly being stripped away. As hate abounds, one can become its prisoner. This can evolve into an imprisoned mindset, diminishing the light of compassion through the darkness of hostility. But that light can be stoked, and that imprisoned mindset freed. Our society needs to know that one act of goodwill, just one seething of love, can bring about change. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Relating to this quote may not come easy for many. With police brutality against black people across the country, it is easy to just choose hate. With so much social injustice surrounding us in these times, to actively spread the seeds of hate with does not take so much effort. But more hate will not stop the violence. It will only fuel the fire. More hate will not bring us life. It will breed death. Our country's adoration towards humanity must never change because choosing to see the greater good in others will allow others to see the greater good in you. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This powerful quote chooses love and hope, inspired people of color facing racism, discrimination, and unequal rights to fight with their voices and their love for one another, allowing them the opportunity to have their character recognized for peace and love promises the hope to bring liberty and justice for all people. I believe that all people are created equal no matter the color of their skin. If we stand together as one people and choose love, we will bring about the unity we crave and deserve as a society, as a nation, and as a people. I, like many, face this choice every day when I walk out into my community and face the social prejudices surrounding me. I can respond with hatred every time I feel I am looked down upon, but to what end? My goal is to earn the recognition of those in my community by sowing the seeds of love and respect and seeking to empower rather than destroy. In conclusion, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that as said by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's unite as a nation, as a country, and as a people and implement change. Remember, kindness can reign over antagonism if we as a community increase the gesture of generosity and sow the seeds of love. I'm Charlotte Kessler, I'm 14 years old. Um, I am in eighth grade and I go to La Villa School of the Arts. I mean, he said those words in even such a like a tough time, and he he still chose not to like hate on other people. He just he was trying to tell us all to just love each other, and that we shouldn't judge people by anything. And I think that's really inspiring. Is there a Charlotte Kessler in this classroom? Hi. I I just want to say great work. Uh, so proud of you, pr proud of your writing, but also proud of your topic, your subject. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, and through them can connect with what you wrote about in terms of what you see in media, social media, all of the pressure and frankly some of the hate and the nastiness. So good for you for standing up for yourself, for standing up for girls and women, 
uh, and for standing up for what's right. I look forward to meeting you someday. It happened last year, someone here at our school, and Miss um, Bethay was telling us about how, like, what's happening and what, what happened, and I was really excited. Dr. King was a gifted student, a gifted speaker, a gifted learner, a gifted in inspiration to all generations. And I think it's wonderful for students today to learn about him, to learn about his legacy, to learn about what he said, and to learn really the message that we should choose love over hate. My topic was how um, women are always like judged and perceived in the eyes of the public. How they're never like they're always wearing too much makeup or not enough, or they're dressing too covered up or uncovered, and how um, they're never perfect in other people's eyes. And how I think that's that's wrong because every every woman is perfect, everybody's perfect in our own way, and we should stop hating on other people for the way we look or act or dress, and focus more on like loving each other. Hate is everywhere. It can be found all over the world in every corner of our society. Where does it start? When will it end? These are the questions I think about often when I see the news and read hateful stories on social media, or even listen to how people act in public. Um, as a young woman, one of the biggest hurdles I see and experience daily is how women are supposed to be perceived in the eyes of the public. Social media has become such a large part of our lives, and with good always comes bad. On Instagram and Facebook, women are encouraged to look a certain way. It makes, me, it makes me sad to see women feel as though they must portray themselves as tall, thin, and heavily made up. That's not the women I know. That's not the women I know. All women have different shapes and sizes, and they're all beautiful. In most of the movies and television shows I watch, women are supposed to act a certain way. Um, many times, women are also portrayed as the victim waiting for the hero to come rescue them. I also get frustrated because I know women, strong women, that serve in the military, law enforcement agencies, teachers, fire departments, and medical fields. As often as women are portrayed on television, that's not, as for the women portrayed on television, that's not the women I know, and it's certainly not the women I look up to. Finally, in public, I see women standing up for their rights. I see a lot of hatred towards women that want to keep the right to choose and, the wa and women that want to keep the right to life. Both sets of women represent the best of what Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to tell us. Stick with loving one another because hate is too much of a burn, too great of a burden to bear. In my own life, I have been harassed on social media and told what to wear, how to act, what is beautiful, and what is not. I would get upset and then I would get angry. I sometimes wonder about the challenges our future generations will, will have to encounter. And then I remember what's important to me. I want to be one of those, wo one of those women that someone can look up to. I want to stick with loving one another and loving myself for who I am because hate is too much of a burden to bear. I'm Jagger Leach, I'm 18 years old from uh, Stanton and I'm a senior. It's just amazing to have someone to look up to, someone who's just like so uh, open to not even just the African American community, just everybody, he just, his message of love is just truly inspiring. Jagger believes strongly that conversation and inclusivity is so important, which totally is what Martin Luther King is all about. Um, he wants everyone to have their voice heard. He wants people to know about different causes. He wants people to feel included. And he has recognized that when people feel included, that they are much more able to give and be part of the group. I wanted my um, answer just to be truly from the heart. I didn't want it to be like a scripted like message where I just chose love uh, over hate. But I wanted it to truly be like something that people who were reading this would be able to be like, in, I guess inspired by it, just like as I was inspired by, by Martin Luther King. So truly just bring his message of love just uh, to fruition. As an American Jew, I face hate all the time. Whether it's going to school and hearing students tell Holocaust jokes, 
or applying to college that I, a college that I later find out supports the anti-Semitic BDS movement. Whether it's anti-Semitism, racism, bigotry, or prejudice, the easy, res the easy reaction is to fight hate with hate. But as Martin Luther King once said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. I have taken this approach to dealing with anti-Semitism. One instance of this was during my sophomore year. I was sitting in math class, and we had some free time ca to catch up on work and chat with classmates. I noticed that there were two kids in front of me giggling and speaking in Arabic, including one classmate that I had been friendly with. During this conversa their conversation, I heard what sounded like the word Yehudi, which is the word for Jew in Hebrew. I knew that Hebrew and Arabic were sister languages, and their use of the word and tone of language took me by surprise. After they used the word once more, one of the kids looked back at me and continued laughing. Once again, I felt uncomfortable, but I let it go. A couple minutes later, one of the kids turned around, chuckling, and asked me where my horns were. There is a popular anti-Semitic trope of, ha of Jews having horns, but I never thought that people, particularly my classmate from school, actually believed Jews had horns. And this person was clear, clearly just trying to get a laugh from his buddy. Reading about people perpetuating anti-Semitic tropes had filled me with anger. But now faced with it in person, for some reason, I didn't feel hatred. I knew that my classmate was a good person. We had talked previously and helped each other stay on top of work in the class. Instead of responding angrily, I simply, just simply told him that Jews did not have horns, and it comes from a translation error in the Latin Bible. We talked for a little bit, and I brought up how Jews and Muslims are historically brothers and sisters, and that we should show love for one another. Rather than applying, uh, replying angrily, I replied with love in my heart. He seemed to realize what he had said was wrong and apologized. We went throughout the year talking as we had before, and no hatred was perpetuated. After this encounter, I chose to dedicate myself to doing what I could to stop anti-Semitism. I spent some time for, to further research the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, and, participate, and participated in a six-week study abroad trip to Israel, studying the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with the hopes of understanding each perspective. Benjamin Franklin, Franklin wisely said, there was never a good war or a bad peace. His words may never have rung truer than today. Let's give our tomorrow's leaders winners a virtual round of applause. And now let's welcome Mr. Darnell Smith, Florida Blue Market President for North Florida. the CEO of Guidewell in Florida Blue. 
all of us have experienced losses from COVID-19. In fact, in my family, we lost my mom, my dad, and my sister. And those losses were not due to COVID, but we were not able to come together and grieve as a family. We've all experienced loss, and we all have to do something and take action for our community. We need to act out of love and not out of fear. And our action needs to be to get a vaccination. I'm Pastor Mark Griffin. This past Thanksgiving was the first time in a long time that I did not get to spend it with my mother, who is 88 years old. And I wanna make sure that that never happens again due to COVID-19. So my mother has already received her first vaccination. And as soon as it's my turn, I want to make sure that I do the same thing. I wanna encourage you whenever it's your opportunity, make sure you get your vaccination because it's so important that we get back to a normal life, which we cannot do until we receive the COVID-19 vaccine. From me to you, what I think is important for you to know is as this vaccine has been developed, there has been an opportunity for minorities, including Blacks, to be involved in the research. And that in and of itself is one of the things I think that should be encouraging to us about feeling safe, accepting the vaccine. My two 81-year-old parents have received their first, first dose of the Moderna vaccine. And as soon as I have an opportunity, I will be in line as well. Take care. Uh, for those who have had the, the virus itself, it still is very beneficial for you to receive the vaccine. Uh, research has been showing that it enhances the protection you get uh, if you get the vaccine, even though you've had the virus already. So I wanna encourage everyone to get it. It doesn't cost you much. Uh, actually, it doesn't cost you anything. So <laughs> uh, whether you have insurance or don't have insurance, if the vaccines come near you, get it, okay? The COVID vaccine, is crucial to helping to control the pandemic. We all have a part to play, including getting vaccinated when it's our turn. We wanna be able to protect ourselves and the people we love most to make sure that we are all stronger and safer together. When it's your turn, the vaccine will be free and I am committed to taking the vaccine as soon as I have the opportunity. I hope that you will join me in the fight against racism and the fight against COVID-19. I'm Nat Glover, and I will be taking the vaccine without hesitation and without reservation. And of course, I encourage you to do the same. The vaccines will be given in classes. Of course, the most critically at risk first, and then when your class comes up, please get the vaccine as soon as possible. The vaccine is a scientific process and it is designed to help you to protect you against COVID-19. We must all remember, even though we are vaccinated, please remember to continue to wear your mask in the appropriate way, which is covering your nose and mouth like this. That's the only way to help stamp out this virus. We can do this together. We can do this for our community and we can act out of love for one another. Hello friends, my name is Darnell Smith, Market President of North Florida at Florida Blue. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On March 25, 1966, at a press conference before his speech of the Medical Committee for Human Rights Convention, Dr. King said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice, and health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. Let that sink in. Nearly 55 years ago, Dr. King described precisely what we are experiencing today. The fact that black Americans are dying at a rate well beyond those of other groups from COVID-19 is not a surprise to those who have been paying attention. What do health and healthcare have to do with civil rights? Dr. King often advocated for equality in areas of poverty, 
racism, education, and housing. We now refer to those as social determinants of health because we understand the relationship to a person's health. The absence of civil rights affect health. I'd be remiss if I did not thank everyone, especially first responders, medical personnel, health care and government leaders who work tirelessly to ensure that all of us are safe and well. Additionally, I applaud all essential workers, teachers, servers, and anyone on the front line for working to keep our freedom and economy strong. The term civil rights is defined as the rights of citizens to political and social freedom and equality. The freedom and equality of people of color are breaking through right now due to the relentless hard work of so many of you who refuse to allow anyone's voices to be muted. As evidenced by the 82-year-old former cotton picker in Georgia who recently helped pick her grandson to be the first black senator of that state. So many civic, business, and government leaders are working tirelessly to drive change that will ensure equity, equality, and justice for every citizen. This moment in our country feels different. Months after the terrible tragedy that resulted in the death of George Floyd, leaders and organizations are more resolute than ever in the pursuit of Dr. King's dream. Last June, Florida Blue's parent company, Guidewell, established the Equity Alliance Task Force to address systemic racism and resulting health disparities for black Americans. Over the next five years, Guidewell has committed $25 million in investments to organizations focused on diversity and inclusion, as well as health equity. Our city government, chamber, and many civic and business leaders have similar commitments. I know many of you are involved in the relentless work to achieve freedom and equality for people of color. Let's demonstrate our leadership by getting our communities vaccinated against COVID-19 so we can get on with the business of freedom and equality for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dornell. So I don't have to tell you this. You know this year has looked a lot different than it has in the past. And along with the theme, we've decided to do something a little different today. Instead of one keynote speaker, we've invited Jacksonville community leaders to join in a moderated discussion about racial injustice, education, health care, uh, economic mobility, and other moderated questions. So I want to get right to introducing our panel, and we thank them so much for being here today. Uh, first, we have Jacksonville Mayor Lenny Curry, uh, Superintendent of Duval County Public Schools, Dr. Diana Green, Dr. Leon Haley, CEO of UF Health Jacksonville, and also Michelle Braun, President and CEO of United Way Northeast Florida. So once again, we want to thank our panel so much for being here this morning. Thank so you. my first question for you all, uh, we, we want to talk about the recent events. There's been a lot in our country lately. Uh, for example, like the fight for racial equality. Uh, how has this impacted you personally and also professionally. Uh, Dr. Haley, we'll start with you and then we'll go around. Well, thank you and thank you for the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. So, you know, from a personal standpoint, uh, it's been a big challenge. I mean, I'm an African-American male, um, just past 56 years old. I have three African-American children. And I think the biggest challenge has been trying to, you know, help them continue to grow in how they think about uh, their their point in life um, as African Americans, as a sports player, as a lawyer, as a college student, and where they fit, and think about the challenge and how to respond to that appropriately, and think about positive action steps that they can take. And I think about it the same way. So from my standpoint, I think about what can I do from a healthcare perspective to really address the racial inequalities in our country. I think you know I'm sure we'll talk more about COVID, but COVID has laid bare what we all know, the challenges in health care, the challenges in social determinants of health, how that is related to both the hospital care, medical care, but also where people live, the economics, the challenges, the racism. So what we try and do, what I try and do as a professional is think about ways that we and our organization at UF Health can really make a difference. And I'll talk more about that coming up. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks to the host committee and Mayor Curry for having us and having me. Um, on behalf of United Way, we're so proud to be here. Um, when, when I w just graduated from high school, co not high school, college, I went to the South Bronx and um, I taught high school in the South Bronx. And it was 1992 and Rodney King riots happened. And one of the things that happened this summer with George Floyd was, how are we here again? That's almost 30 years ago. And that really influenced me back then. But what happened this year is we really listened. I listened to our team and the pain and the, Dr. Haley, you talked about it, but some of the recent racism that my team has experienced really changed things for me. And as a white woman, as a position of an organization that we can make change, we've committed to being um, a voice for that and helping give a voice to others. Dr. Green. Also, I'm very honored to be here this morning. Thank you, Mayor Curry, for inviting me and the committee. Uh, I have a personal experience. M my son, I have two sons who are adults. And my son was, uh, started his first year as a teacher. And he was driving home from teaching class. And uh, he wasn't speeding, but he was in a very nice red, uh, it's not a Camaro, but very nice red car. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, law enforcement pulled up behind him and followed him and for at least two miles. And so he, he gets on the phone, he calls his dad and, and he calls me and he says, mom, I don't know why, why are they following me? And so we tell him, pull over, uh, stop at the next gas station. And so he did. And, and then he waited about 10 minutes and he pulled out and they, they waited for him. He, they followed him to the county line. And it was an experience that um, that I know he will never forget, but one that we knew this had to be only because of the color of his skin. And so when this summer happened, it just resonated all over again with my family. So I experienced this personally as a mother, as a wife, uh, and, and at, with my nephews and, and my family members, we experienced this each and every day. And it impacts how I am as a leader for Duval County Public Schools. It, it, it pushes me to ensure that we offer every opportunity. I'm the superintendent for all students, for all 130,000, but I ensure that we put, uh, uh, our board really started pushing that, those policies to ensure that we have equity. And my role is to make sure that we implement those practices. And we work very hard to ensure that all of our students uh, have access to high quality education because we know that education can be the pathway to prosperity, it can be the pathway out of poverty, it can be the pathway to many of our students realizing uh, their dreams and their desires. Thank you, Dr. Green. Mayor. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, thank all of you for doing this. And I think it's important that uh, in this era of COVID that we continue with this tradition and this breakfast. So it's, I'm grateful to be here virtually and to be able to communicate with people. Um, Dr. King had a dream. Uh, and because of that dream and because he put himself out there, we've come a long way. But we're nowhere close to achieving that dream. And we saw that on full display this summer with people making their voices heard. A couple of quick personal experiences. Um, I was born in South Florida in a small town. Very, very diverse small town. Um, had no idea uh, differences based on uh, color, background, income levels. Uh, we moved out uh, toward the latter years of my middle school. Uh, and in eighth grade, it's the first time I saw and recognized and realized that people judged one another based on the color of their skin, maybe based on their socioeconomic background. I don't know if that's because we moved to a different part of the state or if just because as kids, we don't really see that stuff. We're taught that stuff, right? In eight, in, as kids, we care. Kids care and love one another. Um, fast forward to own personal experience. Uh, a few years ago, uh, probably three or four years ago, uh, my son had friends over. I've told this story before, but it really sticks out. They were in the backyard, jumping fence, neighbor's yards, running around, being kids. They were probably 12 years old, maybe 11 at the time. One of those boys of about five or six was an African-American and it was getting dark and it dawned on me that him jumping yard to yard in my neighborhood 
presents some level of risk just because mm -hmm. of the color of his skin. And I didn't tell them why, I just said, hey, let's play in the backyard. Um, personal experience, what do you do with that? Fast forward to this summer. Um, people making their voices heard. I went out and walked uh, with one of the uh, downtown over the summer with a group of folks, uh, protesters, and uh, it was uncomfortable. And someone said to me afterwards, why did you do that? You were standing in a crowd, there were people yelling at you. Uh, it, it just, it wasn't a good look. And I said, well, I thought it was important to let people know that their voices were, the reason they're protesting is because their voices aren't being heard and action's not being taken. And that's why we're all here to try to take action. Thank you, Mayor. So my next question also for the entire panel, and I, I do want to go ahead and start with you, Mayor. Um, as the top leader in our community, what are your ideas or plans you already have in place to unite the people in our city during these very tough, intense times? Well, I've always led with the one city, one Jacksonville. Uh, and I've always said that that's an incredibly fragile idea, uh, and it's not easy to do, and that is to be one people. Uh, we have experienced that in times of crisis. Uh, we come together when we have uh, a hurricane. Uh, we come together when COVID started uh, early, last, early this past year. Uh, people were unified and not attacking each other. Um, so I think it's just important to remind each other that we have it in us. I have policies in place that represent and invest in all neighborhoods, uh, investing in our youth and education, uh, making sure we are working towards economic equity uh, and opportunity for everyone. But I think the way that we treat each other really matters. And it's, it's, not, it's not always easy. We live in an era where anyone can go online and say anything they want about another person. Um, I, look, I've been tempted to react and I have reacted before, but I think that we need to slow down and as Dr. King said, uh, choose love over hate. Uh, and it starts at the top. And one of the things I'm doing this year, and I, I'm, I'm saying it to my family every single day, because if you say it, you have to hold yourself accountable. Try to be your best self every day, and that will spread to the people around you. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. Green, do you have a response to that question? Yes, as the leader of Duval County Public Schools, we advocate for Team Duval, that we're all in this together. Uh, every time I have an opportunity to speak, I talk about, hey, it's time to get off the sidelines and get into the game and be a part of the solution instead of standing on the sidelines criticizing. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've done with our employees and our students is actually being transparent and writing to them. Uh, when COVID started, every week I would send them a letter and actually uh, expose some of my own personal feelings, the things how COVID was impacting my family. And today, after last week, I wrote our administrators, I wrote our staff, and then just this week I wrote our high school students. Uh, expressing that we are now looking to them. They have to be the ones to stand up and show us the way through kindness, through respect, through the things that they say on social media. I'm, I'm trying to impart on them that words do matter and that words have uh, power to hurt, they have power to heal, and that it really is gonna take all of us to make that personal decision that uh, that person may be different than me, but I bet if you take a little bit of time to get to know them, you'll find out they have more in common with you than they have that is different than you are. And so we are really working with our staff. I think we've come together as a school district, and, and COVID played a big role in that, in, in that we understand that we are going through trying times and that it really will take all of us working together and that we have to put our uh, not just put our differences aside but to work to break those barriers that are separating us Michelle so in our platform we have the ability to reach a lot of companies a lot of people and like has already been said i think the power is getting to know each other and telling and sharing stories and so we're committed to using our platform to share stories and last night in fact while we 
Mark Lamping and the Jags were signing Urban Meyer. Um, we, Mark was on with Tanisha Tate, and um, head of social responsibility for the Jaguars, with two members of the e Out East community, our East Side community. And we were having a community conversation about race with about 300 people online. And we, it was amazing. And the comments and the feedback, and it, we just it validates that we can use our platform for community change and to k get these conversations going. So that's one thing United Way is committed to doing. And James Baldwin, who's an African-American novelist um, and, and playwright, had a quote that said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed if it's not first faced. And so we are committed to trying to raise this issue through our platforms. Um, believe it or not, there are people who don't think there is racism and who don't understand that systems are designed to prevent people from being successful. And James Baldwin also said that this country is the best country in the world, and because he loves this country so much, he will criticize her. And we, it's incumbent on us to address those things that are not right. And I believe in the American dream, and right now, in our world, in our community, people cannot change their circumstances, no matter how hard they work, in some cases. And so we have to address those systems. Dr. Haley. A great question. A couple different things. A little over a year ago, we started down a pathway at the University of Florida, and um, the initiative has been called One UF. And it's really to think about the University of Florida and Gainesville and Jacksonville was focused really more on our healthcare system about how we come together as a clinical enterprise and our footprint. It took on a different turn this summer when we realized it wasn't really just about our clinical educational research footprint. It was also around where we fit in our community, where we are engaged, how we act as a group of individuals, right? We have physicians, nurses, we go across the entire spectrum all the way through housekeepers and do we have the right platform as an organization to make sure in order to be the clinical enterprise we want to be, the educational enterprise, the research enterprise, you know, we have to take that self-reflection and make sure that we're doing the right thing across our enterprise for all of our citizens. So we did listening forums this summer to make sure we could hear our staff, what their concerns are and questions, um, a self-reflection, look at our leadership team from a diversity standpoint. Um, do we have the right diversity profile for our leaders? And that was on our board level. That's at our manager level. And we've started down a pathway with our new community engagement leader and diversity leader to think about our training needs and go back and say, make sure we've got the right diversity training for our leaders, our managers, our executives. And we're going to roll that out more and more this year. So a very concrete step to make sure we're training everybody appropriately how we do our interviews. One thing Zoom has done, we do a lot of interviews for residents and medical students. It's allowed us to create a different platform to you know, get rid of um, some of the biases we may have or chances that you know students couldn't visit us economically, but now we can interview them on Zoom. So it's allowed us to do some other different things. So that's the internal piece. And then externally, what are the connections we can create? One thing, one advantage we had prior to COVID was myself and the other hospital CEOs always got together sort of at least once a month to kind of talk about common issues. But COVID allowed us to really talk about how we can make a difference from a COVID re response, COVID vaccine response, and allows us to now think about how we engage our community around obesity, behavioral health, cancer, vulnerability, access, a number of different initiatives. And so we've started to have those conversations conversations. Internally, we have an organization or a, a group called the Urban Health Alliance, where we're partnering with our community leaders to think about how could we change the community profile and the challenges our patients have. And one of those is around food. You know, near our institution, it's a little bit of a food desert. And so how can we connect that? So we're going to build a pharmacy, spelled F A or M in our organization so patients have access to food and we're partnering with uh, Feeding Northeast Florida to support that. So we think about the community assets that we have and how can we leverage them to really eliminate a lot of the healthcare barriers as well. So I know all of you interact with people from all walks of life in our community. I, I think we're all in the people business pretty much. So my next question for you is how important is empathy and compassion to you when it comes to understanding people of different backgrounds in our community and also creating meaningful change. Michelle, I would like to start with you. Uh, there is nothing more important, as I said, that understanding where someone comes from and um, being able to um, have empathy is, is the crux of solving this issue. I, you know, again, James Baldwin talked about, um, sometimes you, you asked earlier about hate and light, and if, if 
people who have hatred really are in pain. And so trying to understand um, and, and share love with those people is really what, what we need to do through different forms and different ways. We have to be, hold people accountable. Um, but as we talked about this summer when we listened to our teammates, to really understand and hear truly these examples like Dr. Green just shared with her son that are happening now, happened yesterday, is gonna happen today. Um, and to feel the weight, I mean, I am furious, but then I don't, I mean, that is a privilege for me to be furious because I'm a white lady and I've not had experience that. And to really understand, I, I can't tell you how that conversation, multiple conversations with our team, people of color were shared, people you work with every single day who you love understand that just the day before, someone said, I don't want your 10 year old daughter at my house because she's black. And that happened a month ago to someone on my team. And so I think when you hear those stories, that's why you know, Dr. King had a great quote about um, part of racism is because we're separated and we have to figure out ways to come together. And so we're really, um, we're committed at United Way to using our platform. We have great partnerships with both um, Dr. Green and Dr. Haley and others. And so we're gonna continue to bring people together. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Green? Dr. King said, if we do not work together as brothers, we will perish as fools. Uh, so having compassion is uh, indeed important for us to, uh, when we're working with young children, middle school students, high school students, you have to have great compassion for middle school students because I'm not sure where their brains go during that time of their life, but you know, they, they make rash decisions and, and, and they look to their peers for a lot of their answers. And, and, and I have a special place in my heart for middle school teachers because I know it's, it's a definitely a challenge. But at the same time, we have to balance compassion with commitment, competence, consistency, and accountability. We have to ensure that uh, the things that we have in place for our students are also not roadblocks for our students. And if they are, we have to figure out how to remove those roadblocks. Uh, so again, it's back to coming together and working as a team, or we're gonna perish as fools and, and not, unfortunately, we will ask the question, how did we get here? And uh, it's because we've been blind that the signs have, have been coming to us, we're just not paying attention. And if we're not paying attention in light of what's going on in our nation at this time, then I can't think of a time that we will start to pay attention. Mayor. Uh, yeah, well, Dr. Green, I have two middle schoolers, as you know. <laughs> and, 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 no, and, I, and I will say, so it comes into my house every night. But I will say in all seriousness that there are, there are some teachers and leaders in the schools that my daughters attend that are having real impacts on my daughter's lives because of their experience, the exact drama um, that, that you just uh, discussed. I think compassion and empathy is very important. Uh, and simply put, uh, we, we, we can't condone bad behavior, right? But we can try to understand people. And Michelle, you said it, when people lash out, um, there's something going on inside of them. And I'd, there's a quote, I don't remember who said it, I'm paraphrasing, but when you're engaging with someone, remember that they are fighting some battle. Every single person has got something going on that is difficult. And to try to step back and not react to the negative is hard, but to step back and ask yourself, what might that person be going through? I think it bring the temperature down and give us an opportunity to try to work together as brothers and sisters. And Dr. Haley, I know empathy and compassion very important in the healthcare field. Oh, absolutely, and you know it's really it's always been one of our tenants, but I think even more so with all the events that have occurred in our past year, and it's absolutely a critical skill set for all of our team members, all of our leaders. You know, one of the advantages of being a, an emergency physician is I can tell you we are all the same on the inside. So we all bleed red, same lungs, same hearts. We all look alike. There's no difference, there's no black, there's no white, there's no rich, there's no poor, there's no Hispanic. We are all the same. And so when you understand that at a core biological level, we hope that that translates into how we communicate and talk to each other. You know, we are all human beings. We are all Americans in this country. We live in a great country. We have the opportunity to continue to push it forward 
right? We have to be empathetic. We have to recognize the differences that we have, but then the opportunities that we have together to push us into a new direction or a continued direction of greatness and equality and get rid of all of the barriers that are there. But we have to recognize that we're different. We have to accept everybody's difference. To the mayor's point, you know, people are, have all kinds of challenges. We have to understand everybody's challenges. We have to be able to listen, which is an absolute critical skill, which we seem to be missing oftentimes, and understand that in order for us to move forward, we have to understand each other and work together. And so we in healthcare promote the team concept all the time. There's a physician, nurse, staff members, residents, leaders, but if everybody isn't doing their role and everybody has the ability to understand everybody's you know, concept around around it, then the patient suffers. And so, but you also have to understand the differences and the uniqueness and the talents that everybody brings and make sure we're operating at the maximum level. So it's really important for healthcare leaders to have that emotional you know, intelligence, have to be empathetic, have to be humble, um, but also come together, understand the differences, work together as a team to really push things forward. And Dr. Haley, while we're on the topic of healthcare, I wanna talk about how this pandemic is affecting our community right now, especially our black community. So let's talk a little bit about that, about how the coronavirus is playing a role in the black community right now. What are the statistics? Yeah, so coronavirus has been uh, just a, when we get an opportunity to look back at it, it'll be a fascinating opportunity to think about health and epidemiologic, you know, study. You know, you're talking about a disease that ranges everything from being completely asymptomatic to death. Um, there's not too many diseases in healthcare that do that. Um, but one thing that COVID has done, to your point, is really expose some of the challenges we have um, in our racial demographics and how it's impacted. So unfortunately, um, in this community and across the country, what we've seen is a couple of different things. That uh, African Americans, Hispanics are getting COVID about two to three times uh, more than whites. They are being hospitalized with COVID two to three times more than whites. They are dying from COVID two to three times more than whites. When I look at our own statistics in our hospital, we've admitted well over a thousand patients with COVID. 54% of them have been African American. And what's partly driving that is a number of different things. There's comorbidities, so hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, uh, uh, obesity, those are all pushing. And unfortunately, we see more of that in the African-American community, and that's driving hospitalizations, and unfortunately, that's driving the deaths. Um, so that has been the big challenge that we've seen. Now, that being said, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and it, you know, it warmed my heart coming from UF Health Jacksonville down here this morning, where I was able to pass our own vaccination um, efforts where we're vaccinating seniors and members of our healthcare workers. I passed the VA, who's also doing their vaccine distribution right now. And then you come to Prime Osborne. So we have the opportunity to change this, but we also know that we are still having people die at significant rates, getting COVID. And so we're still in the battle, but great opportunity for us to continue to think about health disparities, how we continue to approach it. And we know um, that the vac vaccination rate is low for blacks. What are solutions to overcoming the preconceptions about the vaccine and distrust of vaccines in the black community? Yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, great, great question. And I think a couple of different things. Um, number one, one, we need to understand the trust and there's legitimate reasons for the trust. So if you look at our history, unfortunately, you think about the Tuskegee experiment, um, Henrietta Glocks, there were times when African-Americans were taken advantage of from the perspective of understanding disease, progression, and study. Um, and so there are legitimate reasons why people are concerned. That being said, we have put a number of things in place in healthcare to prevent that um, in the future and, and as of now. And so one of the things we've been working on and we work with multiple groups and we've talked to Duval County School uh, students is really around education. So educating people around the vaccine, its discovery and its delivery. I think what people don't understand is the mRNA, so the messenger RNA protein that's been developed to help promote this vaccine. We've been working on that for years, trying to find the right disease, quite frankly, to use it for. So there are a number of people that have been working on that for a long time, and now we've been able to put it into good use. So a lot of time on education, a lot of time understanding what people's you know fears and concerns are. Um, you know, We will talk to whoever to make sure we can you know, communicate the vaccine and how it's rolling out and what the side effects are. I've had two doses, I had a sore arm, that's it. 
Um, yes, we've some, seen some people with myalgias and the headache, but it lasts for six hours, eight hours, and then it's gone. So the rate of you know very, very severe effects from the vaccine has been incredibly low. And so we would encourage people, obviously, to get the vaccine. It is one of our tool belts that we continue to promote, along with even after the vaccine, until enough people can be vaccinated, continue your mask, continue your distancing, washing hands. Those are going to be important as we continue to roll out. So we try and alleviate people's fears. We try and talk them through it. Um, one of the reasons why I was one of the first people to get the vaccine, I wanted people to see an African-American leader get the vaccine televised. That wasn't the intent, but, you know, make sure people felt that I would, you know, convey comfort for individuals. Um, and if they had any questions, call me. People call me all the time. And we've talked people through it. So those rates are rising. So people are very, um, you know, very excited to get it. I can tell you, um, if you look at our senior population, very excited to get the vaccine, you know, long lines that you've seen across the country. Um, and so there are groups of people, my own parents can't or can't wait to get the vaccine. Unfortunately, they live in Pennsylvania where they haven't started rolling out the seniors yet. So, you know, lots of education, we, you know, we communicate, you know, we, uh, by the way, at our institution, we do videos. So I do a video for our staff every two weeks. Um, that was prior to COVID. And when COVID started, we started doing it every day. And so literally I shoot a video every day for our staff. We kind of go every other day sometimes, but it's around COVID, but it's also a lot recently about vaccine and communicating it and making sure that people feel comfortable with it. All right, thank you, Dr. Haley. And also we've had some, uh, some of our local students submit questions yeah. that they would like to ask yeah. the panel. And one of the questions for you, how do you feel about the COVID vaccine? But you kind of touched on that for us. So. Yeah. All good, go ahead and get it. Now I will say what's interesting is right now, um, the vaccine has not been studied for people under 16. Right. So unfortunately, they're not a group that we know can or should take the vaccine at this point. So right now, kids under 16 shouldn't take the vaccine. But hopefully as we learn more, we study more, then we can test that group. And I think there was a in our sort of opening salvo, somebody talked about, you know, participating in research. So great opportunity for African-Americans, Hispanics to participate in the research process so we can understand how the vaccine will work in all, all citizens. And while we're talking about our students, I want to talk about our education system here in Duval County, Dr. Green. And my, my question for you, um, according to recent reports, the graduation rate in Duval uh, is at an all time high, which is good news. Uh, but what does this mean for students of color and what is being done to make sure they receive the best education and also support? Well, I think I first need to make sure I clarify. Yes, our graduation rate is the highest it's ever been at 90.2. But I do want to remind our community that was the first graduation during COVID and state assessments were waived and students didn't have to pass a, a state assessment for graduation. That only impacted 6% of our students, but it, it does have some relationship to our, our graduation rate. But what I'm most proud about is that we are closing the gap among our subgroups. Our African-American graduate, graduation rate is 88.8. .8. So we are doing the hard work that it takes to ensure that all students have an opportunity to meet their potential. And again, a, a high school diploma is the foundation to your dreams. Uh, we have a process in place through our school district. Uh, I wanna give credit to one of our new board members, uh, Dr. Coker Daniels. She, along with a team now being headed by uh, Corey Wright, Assistant Superintendent of Research and Assessment, developed a framework to go into high schools and to work with every single student to figure out what are the roadblocks to them not graduating or what could be a roadblock and then develop solutions along with our high school principals, guidance counselors, their teachers on how to remove those roadblocks. That, that process started over five years ago and every single year since then, our graduation rate has improved and narrowed the gap between African-American, Hispanic, um, our students with disabilities, our uh, ELL students, um, our social economic, uh, low social economic students. So today in all of our traditional high schools, we've reached um, less than 3% difference between Caucasian students, or technically our Asian students uh, actually has the highest graduation rate. Between those subgroups, we've narrowed it down to about 3%. And so 
we think we are headed in the right direction, that Duval County Public Schools is, is one of the highest performing urban school districts in the nation. For the last few years, we've been in the top 10 as it relates to NAEP scores. We've, uh, we are four points away from being rated an A uh, school district. So parents and the community should be very proud of a school district that not only is ensuring that we're providing the highest quality education, but we are also advocating for the vaccine for our, our employees, our teachers, um, moved beyond their fears and entered into those classrooms to teach our students. Our students moved, their families moved beyond their fears and have entered into the classroom. Uh, over 77% of our students attend brick and mortar and they are following our protocols. They are wearing their masks. They're social distancing as much as possible. Even our high school students, they're doing their very best. Um, but uh, it, it, it's just amazing what can happen when, again, we've all committed and decided we're going to be a team to get this done. And, and that's what's happening here. And Dr. Green, this next question is actually from a student. Um, they ask, uh, with some students learning from home, what is your overall plan to ensure struggling students keep up in the classroom and are prepared for state-based and required year-end tests? That is a, a big challenge for us. Uh, again, even though 77% are in brick and mortar, we have uh, a little over 24,000 students who are learning from home. And those students that are struggling, um, we are reaching out to them. Uh, as a matter of fact, every parent received a letter that, that their child is working from home. If your child's struggling, here are recommendations that we are uh, presenting to you and parents had to make a decision about what they wanted to do. But we still offer um, therapy for students that may need it for uh, mental health therapy. We are still offering tutoring for students that need that support, whether that tutoring happens virtually or parents are comfortable just coming to, school, to the school for a certain period of time. We uh, have a process in place by which we uh, do what we call check-ins. So either it's the guidance counselor, the dean, or uh, believe it or not, even our truancy officers. We are in constant contact with those families whose students are struggling uh, but learning remotely. And we want to honor the wishes of those families because if you're not comfortable sending them to school, we need to meet you where you are and that's what we're doing. Let's talk about the recently uh, passed half cent sales tax. How is that money being used to improve schools in our community, especially those in minority neighborhoods? Yes, the referendum, uh, first thank you to our community for uh, having the faith and voting to support that referendum. Uh, that is a 15-year project, and uh, many of the schools that need to be replaced or rebuilt are in those neighborhoods, our urban core, and working, we had over 22 community meetings with the community to talk about the changes that needed to be made, and that Duval County has the oldest schools in, in the state of Florida, and our oldest schools are in uh, mostly our north, northwest side of, of our community. And the funding will allow us to start that process uh, of moving forward of replacing those schools. Uh, people think about, well, it's the teacher that makes the, 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 that makes the difference, and they're absolutely correct. But we have to attract teachers to want to teach into those schools. When you go to someone, when you go to someone's house, the first thing you notice is their house. You notice their furniture. You notice all the things, and and even you notice these things. And if you're not comfortable, then I'm I'm going to have a hard time getting you to commit to stay. And we need facilities that are functioning on a with 21st century resources. Um, we have buildings that if you walk in that building, your cell phone just doesn't work. And we're in an era where our teachers are supposed to be able to immediately dial 911 if they needed to from their mobile phone. Well, if your mobile phone doesn't work in the building, 
then, then we have an issue. So we have a range of issues, whether it's safety and security, to ensuring that students have access to 21st century resources that this referendum will allow us to accomplish. And our goal is to ensure that the communities where those new schools are being built, those schools are gonna be built. Dr. Green, thank you. Michelle, let's talk about the United Way and the work that you're doing here in our community. My first question for you is, how is the United Way helping minorities during the pandemic, especially those who live in underserved communities? Thanks, Anthony. I think, um, like Dr. Haley said, unfortunately, um, disparities are two and three times um, worse for people of color. So United Way's focus is to address um, issues of poverty, and in the pandemic, we have to focus on the immediate needs and also on the systemic thing. So um, systems are perfectly designed to get the results we're getting. And so we're trying to do both things. We're trying to address immediate needs. So we have a 211 um, call center where we have call specialists who can, anyone can dial 211 from any phone and get referred to their needs. And sometimes we refer to these amazing partners. The city is a partner in that work. Those calls more than doubled. And in fact, in those first few months during the pandemic, calls for food assistance went up 400%. In this day and age, in our community, People are hungry. And so um, my point about Dr. Haley is that the, the disparity in that group is two and three times higher for people of color. And so we are making sure that we're trying to address that. We have unique partnerships with some of the folks that have already been mentioned to make sure in that case we're getting food to people with farm share and feeding Northeast Florida. But we're also addressing the system behind that and trying to look at the issues. We're working right now, um, people are very worried about evictions, and so we're working with judges and um, the, the, the city and others to have an eviction um, diversion partnership where we can try to head off some of that. We work with JEA on electricity bills and helping people pay that. Many generous people in this community, including the city, helped fund a relief fund when COVID hit that we ran. Um, $5.4 million went out the door in almost um, you know, eight, eight plus weeks, which is a very short time to get that much money out the door. And the highest needs were on food and helping pay rent and electricity bills. Um, but we try to fund both things. We try to fund both the, the basic needs as well as the systems. And so my next question for you, how do you create a community of opportunity? What is the United Way's focus this year? So our mission and our vision is to build a community with, with, with our partners, a community of opportunity where every single person has hope. Hope's not a strategy, but it's people have to have hope. A community of opportunity where everyone has hope and can reach their full potential. And right now in our community, that's not happening. 40% of people in our community cannot meet a minimum survival budget. So that means they have to make trade-off. Do I buy my medication or do I buy my food? Or do I, you know, if I can't get to work, I lose my job and now I'm in, officially in poverty. And so um, our, our, all our systems, all our programs, our partnerships are designed to tackle those issues. Um, right now in Jacksonville, if someone is born in the lowest rung of poverty, unfortunately, there's less than a 5% chance they're gonna get all the way out of poverty. And we know that's not the American dream. That is not, you know, that is what Dr. King was fighting for. Um, ultimately, it was about economics and the disparities. And so we are committed to um, even more to looking at those core issues and partnerships in community. We think that the people with the best answers are the people that are closest to the issues. And so we're changing some of our processes so that we can get closer to the people in community and, and build solutions with them. This next question is from one of our Duval County students, and they want to know, how are you planning to help families post-pandemic? Well, when, when we're going to be post-pandemic, Dr. <laughs> right, Haley? Which is a good question. When <laughs> it's will a great be, question. <laughs> uh, truly, we were in the middle of doing some strategic planning, and we said, okay, you know, we, we're not looking five years out now like some plans do. We need to look right now and here. And so the things I just talked about really are the things we're focused on. Um, the disparity, especially focused on community, and how can we help um, the things like we're talking about, make sure that we use our network to get people vaccinated and make, you know, break down barriers and have conversations um, to make that happen. How can we make sure that we're addressing, you know, we, we don't, you haven't seen the same food lines 
um, here in Jacksonville like you have in, in some cities. And that's not by accident. That's because a lot of people, the city, um, and our, our awesome nonprofit partners, our nonprofit partners have been on the front lines in so many ways in addition to um, the hospitals and our teachers. And they have come up with so many creative ways. So we are trying to, in the immediate um, aftermath of the pandemic, learn and, and really address the issues so that we can change things that, you know, we say we don't want to go back to normal. You know, we're ready to take off the masks and not have to social distance, but we're committed to not going back to normal. Normal meant that 40% of people can't meet their bills. And so in the post-pandemic, we're going to double down on those things, and we are going to be more focused on the disparities um, between um, people um, uh, of color. Michelle, thank you. Okay. Mayor Curry, my uh, question for you, what are your priorities right now as mayor to unite our city, especially when it comes to race relations and empowering those who may feel overlooked in our city? Yeah, I think um, first the policies matter. Um, I've had budgets that have invested and will continue to invest in young people. Uh, that's educational opportunities, that's real job opportunities, that's summer programs, after school programs. We do that in partnership with uh, Duval County Public Schools. Uh, the other thing is, if, from a policy perspective, I'm working with some council members now uh, for the next budget cycle. You know, when the city consolidated in the late 60s, uh, there were promises made that just frankly weren't kept. Uh, neighborhoods and infrastructure, uh, many of those broken promises were in the African-American community. So we're working on, in the remaining budgets I have, doing what we can to try to start to right some of those wrongs and those broken promises. But I also think that um, uh, from a leadership perspective, how we communicate matters. Uh, partisanship is... Uh, destroying this country right now and it's destroying communities. Look, I, before I was uh, mayor of this city, I was the chair of the state Republican Party. So I've been involved in the, literally in the heart and gut of partisanship. But I can say now that uh, no divisive language, no partisanship language, we have to figure out how to speak together, unite together and work as one community. That doesn't mean we're gonna agree on every issue, but we've gotta stop this partisan divide. And you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want to go into it a little bit more. Um, I would like to address your priorities as it relates to creating effective change uh, in our minority communities uh, in the areas of crime, healthcare, and education. So crime continues to be a serious issue for our city with yet another unfortunate homicide record this year. Um, at the same time, when it comes to COVID, there's been a dis proportionate rise, of, as we talked about with Dr. Haley, of cases among black and other minority populations. So what are your solutions right now to overcoming the distrust of vaccines among the black community? And when it comes to crime and education, uh, what are you doing to ensure that these communities have the resources that they need right now? Well, one of the first things is you, where there are crimes committed, where shootings are happening, uh, we have to act, law enforcement has to get those people off the street. You have to have the enforcement arm. Uh, and if you talk to all communities, including the African American community in our city, uh, they welcome more of a police presence that will in fact demonstrate that all neighborhoods matter and all neighborhoods need to be protected. We've invested in technologies that will get these, uh, to get the, the folks that pull the trigger off the streets. But I go back to Kids Hope Alliance, which is where we invest in young people. These programs are critical, uh, and they don't show results overnight. But so when I took office, there was a mayor's job program in place from the previous administration, a wonderful program that was doing good work. Uh, members of the community asked me to expand that. We've expanded that to the private sector. They asked to expand it beyond the summer to year round. So to be clear, a teenager that is currently working in one of those jobs programs is a teenager today that is less likely to get involved in a gang, in a drug deal, in a bad decision. So we as a community, it's hard to say this, but we're gonna have to be patient. We know that where we invest in young people, we're gonna save a life and we're gonna give opportunity. So uh, we're gonna continue to do that. Uh, from the, the perspective of the pandemic, uh, it can be incredibly frustrating uh, to see misinformation that's spread, frankly, even the partisanship that's played out over the course of the pandemic. Dr. Haley and I and a group of hospital leaders talk regularly. I mean, the whole mask thing, uh, it's become political and that is completely insane. 
from my perspective. Um, not just from my perspective, I think we're right, right, mm -hmm. Dr. Haley? Yep. It's a simple tool we have to protect each other as we navigate this. In terms of trust, um, I think that leaders like Dr. Haley taking the vaccine will demonstrate to the African American community that, that it can be trusted and that you should take it. Um, uh, when it's my turn, let me step back and say, if I were Dr. Haley and in his shoes, I would have done the exact same thing. I would have taken that vaccine, A, because of the job that you have, mm -hmm. but B, because of the message that it communicates. Um, when it's my turn to take the vaccine, in terms of uh, where I fall on the risk charts, the people of Jackson will need to know. I'm going to take it. Uh, my wife's going to take it. Uh, we believe in it. We believe it's important. And the only way we're going to get through this pandemic is with facts and truth and not the political divide and the partisanship that is played out with misinformation. And uh, we're running out of time. We have about five minutes left. But I do want to ask one question um, from a student. And that student asked, with tensions being so high right now, is there anything in place to make sure what happened in D.C. doesn't happen here? Well, I, I'm going to go back to what I said a few minutes ago, and I think that it's incredibly important that we don't speak partisan language in our community as leaders. Because um, partisan language will do nothing but divide and anger people. Um, the second piece is uh, our law enforcement, local law enforcement, their intelligent unit, intelligence units, uh, always understand what chatter is happening. I've been, I've been in this job for five years now, and, and on any given week or month, I hear about potential threats. So they're, they're generally ahead of it. Uh, look, we had uh, protests over the summer. They were largely peaceful. There were some bad actors, uh, but most of those people wanted their voices heard. So I believe Jacksonville will stay true to that. Uh, if people decide in this community that they want to, their voices to be heard, I believe they'll do it peacefully. Uh, and, and that's how, you, in a civilized society, that's how you make change, right? You, you, your voice is heard, you put pressure on elected officials and leaders to make change uh, and implement policies that will make a difference. Okay. But let's, let's just, I want to go back. Let's be very, Dr. Green, you said it with the students. Words matter. What we say can either heal, calm or in sight and let's try to heal calm and unite mayor thank you before we go i, I do want to ask a question for everyone on the panel uh, dr king once said i have decided to stick with love hate is too great a burden to bear so what does this mean to you and your work for helping the people around you mayor we can start with you i think choosing love is a daily if not hourly uh, if not an in-the-moment decision. Uh, and so, look, I, I've, one of the things I've started to do this year is to just write every morning uh, and write consistently. And one of those I said earlier is try to be your best self. Uh, and that holds, an individ that holds yourself accountable. On any given moment, we can choose hate. If someone reacts to us negatively, we react back in a negative way. None of us are perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But... If you choose to be negative seven out of 10 times, the three positives, you're a negative person. You have chosen hate over love. So to just be intentional in every single moment to try to bring the temperature down and choose to have compassion and love and think about what that person's going through. Dr. Green. Well, you know, the Bible says, love thy neighbor as thyself. And it really does start with yourself. You have to wake up, as the mayor says, wake up every morning and desire to be your best self. Because if you love yourself, you will know how to be compassionate. You will know how to exhibit empathy. You will know how to be fair and equitable uh, in your interactions with anyone. Um, but I know that many of our children, our families are hurting and it's hard to wake up and, and feel that love. And so as uh, citizens of this community, I encourage everyone to reach out to someone else and check on them and encourage them and lift them up. And someone calling, uh, you know, I welcome anyone calling me to encourage me. Um, so often they see leaders, they feel that we don't have feelings or they feel that we don't have our own challenges and our own issues. But I think we will be a better, stronger community 
when we all decide that one, we're going to take care of ourselves and love ourselves and then share that love with, with, with our neighbors. Thank you, Dr. Green. Michelle. Um, so, you know, I, I was listening to you and I did send you a text, I think, when you were announced <laughs> to be um, superintendent of the year right here. So I want to give a shout out to Dr. Green. Um, <laughs> definitely. Um, right. I, I uh, purchased, I can't believe a COVID time is so crazy, but it was a year ago, we were kicking off um, a, an initiative that we have with our friends out east um, to uplift that community um, together, not us lifting them up, but lifting it up together called Root and Rebuild. And Suzanne Pickett is the head of the East Side Coalition, the Historic East Side Coalition. She's also an artist and she did a painting that I bought a year ago because another thing we can do to support communities of color is to um, help help support the businesses. And so I bought a painting she made and it was it's a heart and at the bottom has a quote by Dr. King that says, the only force capable of changing an enemy to a friend is love. And um, I actually, like some of you, I write to my team um, every, every week, and I use that quote this week because, especially with events in D.C., and watching that again, and watching the layers on my African American and people of color on our team, that what that it was infuriating to me, but to them, the difference in how that crowd was treated from over the protests over the summer. And, there was a lot of anger and we were on a call again we gathered to talk and listen and my teammates um, of color who were so angry said but i will not let hate take over and if people who have been facing this for 400 years aren't going to let hate take over i cannot and i need to be an example of light and um, make that choice because it is a choice and so i encourage all of us to take from this take dr king's message of peace and choose choose light over darkness thank you michelle Dr. Haley. You know, I'll actually go back to your original question about the sort of personal experience around and to answer it. So I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I had the opportunity to go to an elite private school outside of Pittsburgh, um, but I was the only African-American in my class for really the first eight years of being there. Um, and so I was teased, called every name in the book. Um, by the time I got to high school, I remember playing a football game. We played at a, a, a school in rural Pennsylvania and there was a burning cross in the background as we're playing the football game. So I could have chosen a pathway of hate all along, right? Or anger, or that would be my response. Instead, I chose to understand love and chose faith, really, faith in God and faith in sort of direction and my parents' you know, desire for education for me, my brother, my sister, um, and chose that instead of hate. And so that's where we are right now in this country, if you fast forward. Uh, sort of the point that was made. You could choose to hate, right? You could choose anger, you could choose to be frustrated, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could choose love, you could choose faith, you could choose the opportunity to, you know, understand, collaborate, you know, work with people of whatever the difference is, whether it's a Republican, Democrat, black, white, rich, poor, but you have to understand people's differences and you have to choose love and faith to get there, right? Because if you choose anger, you'll never cross the divide that you're trying to get through. So we choose love, we choose an opportunity to you know, work together. That's the way we you know, talk at UF Health, that's the way we talk with our patients, that's the way we talk with our team members. You know, we wanna make sure that yes, we all have our unique differences, uh, but we choose to work together, we choose to be a team, we choose to you know, have this opportunity to take our love with each other and then put that in our patients, right? Getting back to your other question, you know, how do you make a difference, right? We have to take care of ourselves, but we also have to make sure we're taking care of our patients as well. And if we're angry, we're not going to do a good job of taking care of patients. We're not going to do a good job of, you know, eliminating those health disparities. So you really have to choose that. Um, but part of that, and I think I can't remember who exactly said it, Dr. Green or Michelle, if you don't love yourself, um, then it's impossible to sort of create that thing. So you got to go back to making sure you love yourself, making sure you love yourself as a person, where you fit in society, and how you can continue to improve that, and then you can take that forward. Thank you, Dr. Haley, and I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here this morning to have these important discussions. It's so important that we do come together and talk about things like this, no matter how hard it may be, and to share um, your personal stories. Listening to Dr. Green tell the story about her son, you know, that goes beyond the superintendent hat, that's her as a mother. So it's just so, it's so important that we hear these stories so we can learn from them and move from here, move together and build our community. So once again, thank you so much to all of you for speaking this morning. Let's go now to uh, Joy Purdy. 
Thank you to our esteemed panelists. We truly appreciate your time and insightful discussions. And we would like to thank you for continuing to motivate and encourage so many people through your leadership and work in the community. Now, I'd like to introduce Baba Karba, Vice President of TIAA Bank. Babakar Bob, Vice President at TIAA Bank. I'm really honored to be here with you today to celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. At TIAA and TIAA Bank, our core values are centered on making the communities where we live and work even better. That's why we teamed up with the City of Jacksonville to present the Be the Change Scholarship Program. Hope you liked the video we shared with you earlier. I'm going to share a little bit more about the program today. In June of 2020, TIA launched Be The Change, a four-pillar platform to support the work against racial injustice through understanding, dialogue, leadership, and action. So we're inviting students at 14 area high schools to submit an essay around one of the four pillars of Be The Change. To share with us a big idea that the city of Jacksonville can tackle with the community for the work against racial injustice and the role that the students will play. Three winners will be selected to receive a $5,000 scholarship. The students can submit their essays by visiting tiaabank.com slash scholarship. They have until January 31st to do so. We will announce the winners by the end of February. Thank you very much for continuing to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King and our future generation of leaders. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful and happy MLK. What a way to bring this annual celebration to a close. We challenge everyone today to be the best at what you do, encourage others around you, and be the positive role model for change in our community. Like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great of a burden to bear. Thank you for joining us at the 34th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast presented by Florida Blue.